Here's what I hope uh, we would do together right now is that we would just begin by praying and asking the Lord to meet with us here. It's not time for opinion hour. It's not time for just, hey, I think. It's time to say, Lord, uh, you have your word prepared for us. It's been here for thousands of years so that we could learn and grow and do this. And so let's invite the Lord to speak and ask him to give us teachable hearts today. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we come to you in the strong name of Jesus. Uh, That's a great way to begin because we recognize who the Savior is. We recognize that the Savior invites us, Jesus. You invite us into your presence. You invite us into your family. You invite us to have our sins forgiven. You invite us to follow you. Lord, we pray that we would do all those things, that we would be found in your family. We'd be found uh, forgiven and ready to follow you. Lord, in this place today, we pray that your spirit would be active among us. For those who need encouragement, encourage them. For those who need to be corrected, correct. Lord, for those who need to be challenged, challenge. Uh, Lord, uh, we pray that you know uh, every heart and that you would minister to each of us just where we need to be, just how we need to be ministered to. Lord, we thank you for that. And so, Lord, as we dive into your word, we pray that you would Give us, again, teachable spirits that we would see uh, who you are, what you've done, and how to live in in response to that. And Lord, we want to be changed as we go out from this place as difference makers in the name of Jesus. We pray all of this in the strong name of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Well, here's what I want to do. I'm going to begin by just uh, thinking about um, what every good story whether it's a comic book, whether it's a movie, whether it's a novel, what, uh, every good story, I want you to think about this, has to have a core truth. Has to have maybe more than that, maybe more than one, but at least one core truth that would anchor it down so that we could identify with it, so that we could relate with it. If there is, uh, some, even from a comic strip, that has nothing that we can relate to, it just falls flat. We don't identify with it. There has to be some truth that we say, hey, that's true in my life. At least at at one level, there's some truth in it. And I want you to think about this, uh, that as we look at a core truth, it means it is observable and it is true wherever you live, or even this, whenever you live. This is true. The comic book industry, uh, they latched onto it, then movies latched onto it, then novels latched onto it. And here's one of the core truths that I think you'll recognize this today. Here's a core truth. There are heroes in this world, and there also are villains in this world. How many of you would agree with that? There are heroes, and there are villains in this world, and they affect our lives every day. Now, don't be thinking about capes and masks and all of those things. We're thinking about real people, real people. This is what I mean. Good versus evil, a power struggle uh, that we witness good embodied, and we'd say, hey, that's a hero. Evil embodied, hey, that's a villain. And that as we think about heroes and villains, uh, as they uh, exist and they affect our lives, we know this, that many times in a book or a story or a movie or a TV show, there's a hero and that hero has an arch enemy, somebody who is opposite to them. And so I want to see, just to get us thinking, to get us going, and it's going to lead us to where we're headed today to look at heroes and villains. That's the title of the message today, but I want to get you thinking about this. Let's do this. Let's see how well you know uh, your heroes and villains. Uh, and if you don't know them well, go ahead and work with somebody around you. You can do that. Let's start with this one. Uh, there is uh, the Road Runner. He's a cartoon character, and his his alter ego, his nemesis, is Wiley Coyote. Wiley Coyote. Uh, you can see, like, okay, I get it. I've seen that. I've seen that. I've seen that at least on a T-shirt or on a hat. Um, you maybe I've seen it in reruns forever. How about this one right, right out of the, uh, the superhero world? There is, this is a tougher one. There's Batman and his arch enemy is, mm, he's got a lot of enemies. His arch enemy is the Joker, the Joker. You say, how do you know that? Follow this. Batman never smiles. He's the hero, but he never smiles. The villain is always smiling. He can't stop smiling. In fact, that's, if you're wondering, they drew that, they, they initiated that in that very way that you would know, here is the good guy, even though he doesn't smile. And here's the bad guy who is alter opposite to him, the Joker. There you go. How about this one? There's Superman and he's got an arch enemy. His name is 
Lex Luthor. How do we know that? How do we know that Superman always has great hair? Great hair. Lex doesn't have hair. Superman has all these amazing powers and uh, Lex just has a lot of money and technology and that, that's where it, we find that. Now let's go uh, a little bit further. Uh, let's find this one. Maybe you've seen this in a, uh, the recent movie uh, genre that's happened in the last couple of years. You know him. He's, he's from the wizarding world. His name is Harry Potter. And then his enemy is he who will not be named. He who will not be named. How do we know that they're enemies? Well, because that Harry, he has one scar and his opposite is just one big scar. Just one big, big scar. Harry and he who will not be named. We know that. Okay, let's go to the Star Wars world because that has invaded the, the entire globe. The Star Wars world, the good guys, the good guys, they're the Jedi and the bad guys are the Sith. The Sith. You're like, I don't know this. This is getting weirder by the moment. Okay, let's go ahead and see that there is some truth where we see heroes and villains and we can come right to our Bibles and open them up and we can see this. And you, in, in this way, the good guys, there are some heroes. There are angels who serve the living God and their altar is demonic forces, fallen angels, angels who don't serve the living God anymore, heroes and villains. How about this one? The living God himself. The living God who created everything, uh, even created a being who became an enemy. And that enemy's name is Satan. The devil. Lucifer. The, that, that great serpent. The dragon. Many names that he goes by, but that, that is, he has set himself against the living God. How about this, the Jewish nation? You're thinking, well, man, there's so many different people that they had to fight against, but actually they have the same enemy as the living God, and that same enemy is Satan himself. How about this, the church, including Harvest Community Church, and every church around the globe that proclaims the name of Jesus, we have an enemy, we have an adversary, we have an accuser, we have somebody who is an opponent who is against us, who wants nothing more for your life and for my life and for the life of every church that claims the name of Jesus, he wants nothing more than to kill and steal and destroy. That enemy is Satan. Now let's make it very personal. Who is your enemy? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have an opponent. And it is not, it is not the person who sits in the desk, desk next to you at school. All right? It is not your neighbor down the street, though they may give you fits. That is not your enemy. Your enemy, the Bible says, is the evil one himself. Is Satan, the devil, Lucifer, the angel that created one who hates God and hates anything that God creates. There are heroes and there are villains. That's the core truth that we will discover is played out for us as you see it in God's word today. Let's go ahead and discover it for ourselves. Let's open our Bibles. If you have a Bible this morning, would you get it out? If you need a Bible, would you raise your hand? We'd love to give you one. If you need one to keep, please keep it. I checked the app this morning. It's working. It's ready to go. It's there for you. Everything that's on the screen will be there. And uh, we are in the book of Esther that is found very easily in the first half of your Bible. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job. Mark that spot. Esther chapter 2 is where we'll begin today. We want you to hear from God's word. And I want you to think about this as we open God's word today. Many people approach God's word in this way. They open their Bibles and they thumb through and they say, here's what I like, oh, mm, mm, mm. here's what I don't like, I'm not going to listen to that, here's what I like, here's what I don't like, and they determine, they really set themselves up as God, and say, here's what I like and what I don't like from God's word, where it should be the opposite. Let God's word thumb through your life. Let God's word show you what, that doesn't belong, that doesn't look like me, that is not the truth. Let God's word thumb through your life instead of you thumbing through God's word and seeing what you like and what you don't. That's the beauty of opening God's word and saying, we're just going to go through the book of Esther together. We're going to let it say whatever it wants to say. If it wants to show us that there are heroes and there are villains and they do affect your life today, then we will see that. Let's go there right now as we look at this. In the book of Esther, historical book, Esther chapter 2, beginning with verse 19. Let's uh, read that. Here's what it says. Now, when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai, 
was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. That means they wanted to kill him. That wasn't like, hey, let's rough him up and see how that goes. Uh, let's kill him. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai. And he told it to Queen Esther. And Esther told, it, told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated, I love that. It wasn't just like on, on the word of the queen. It was investigated and found to be so. The men were both hanged on the gallows. We'll talk about that in a moment. And it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. It went down as truth. This really happened. And this is truth. This is God's word for us. Amen. Let's let God's word thumb through our lives and let it expose whatever it wants to expose and show us the truth that we need to see today. I want to give you a little context here. One that you would see this. The king, King Ahasuerus, king of all of the Persian empire, is at it again. He is bringing more young women into his harem. He is gathering them for a second time. And if you thought this like, no, 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 no. He has a beautiful queen. He has a, a good queen. Her name is Esther. Why would he do this? Because the king of Persia doesn't know the word no. He doesn't know these words. He's never responded well to these words. That's enough. If that's you in your life and you, you can't hear, hear the word no, or you can't hear the words that show restraint, that's enough. Then you are in good league with the king and you need to be careful about that. And you need to, to be honest with yourself. If that's where you're living, it's a destructive way to live. He is gathering more virgins. In fact, one commentary that I read about as he gathers more women into his harem, they said it was like him turning the stock over. That like at a store, like, hey, out with the old stock, out to pasture, in with the new stock. And he is always, always hungry. His appetite, uh, nobody says no to him. He's the king. That's the context. That's what's happening. And then meet the hero that comes on the scene. This hero, his name is Mordecai. Mordecai has a name uh, that comes from the name Marduk, which is a uh, ungodly demon, false god, worshipped by the Babylonians. He's named after that. You can tell that Mordecai has lived his entire life in the Persian Empire. He's named a Persian name, even though he's Jewish. And that comes out. That's a big factor in this entire story. His nationality, his race is a big deal. Mordecai is Jewish. In fact, his great, great grandfather is Kish, a Benjamite who was taken captive with so many others, transported far hundreds of miles away from their homeland and taken over to the Persian Empire that is modern day Iran. That's where it is. His great-grandfather was brought there, so he's grown up there. His father grew up there. His grandfather grew up there. And then we find this about uh, Mordecai. He is in the king's employ. Every day when he comes and he clocks in at work, where does he clock in? At the king's gate. That tells us something about him. He works for the government. He works for the king. He comes uh, to the king's gate. There aren't, not everybody comes to the king's gate. Only those who are very powerful and influential in the world of commerce or the judiciary system. He is probably involved in one of those two areas. Um, maybe more likely that he's involved in the judicial system, that this is where all these cases are decided at the king's gate. That's what he works. That's where he works. We know that uh, he has also this. He has a cousin, a cousin who he raised. Her name is Esther. In fact, that's her Persian name probably given to her when she was taken into the harem. She has a Persian name. Esther means star. That's what it means. Named after the goddess Ishtar. That's what she was named after. Her Jewish name, her Hebrew name is Hadassah. It means myrtle. He raised this uh, young lady. He raised her after her parents died. She was orphaned. And so we know some things about this hero, but this is what we also know just by reading this. He is not looking to be a hero. He wasn't down shopping for capes at Costco. 
He wasn't looking for the newest mask, uh, not just for Halloween. He was not looking for this, but he finds himself in a position to stand up and do what is right. He has heard of an assassination plot. He has the opportunity to be a good citizen and that he can stand in there and rescue and save a life, not just any life, the life of the king. And he's not doing this to get a pat on the back. He's doing this because that's what God would ask him to do. And this is what I want you to realize. There's lots of things that could describe a hero today, but one very powerful truth, core truth, that is true wherever and whenever you have lived. If you want to describe a hero, it's this. Would you make sure you get this? Because this could and should describe you. Heroes value life. That's the first thing you need to see today. If you would be described as a hero, you must must, must value life. Life is important to the living God. Life is important because he's the creator of life. In fact, as you read your Bible, you understand that he is life itself. He is where life is, where it originates, where it comes from. God is very pro-life before it was ever coined that phrase, pro-life, because he is life. He is life. Because of that, because of that understanding, you and I can be a hero simply by valuing life, human life. That you and I say that no matter where you live, no matter your income, you're valuable. That is, that is, you're like, well, that's so basic. That's so basic. That's not heroic. It is far more heroic than you realize in a world that devalues life. If you do not value life, including your own, and some people do not, we can safely determine that you are not to be recognized as a hero, period. If you do not value life, including your own, you are not to be recognized as a hero because you don't understand the value and worth of a life. This means for Christians, listen to this very clearly, as a follower of Jesus, if you had your sins forgiven, if you said, Jesus, I want to follow you with my life, I recognize you for who you are, you're the son of God who came for me, you died on the cross for me, you value life then I should value life, the life of the aged, the life of the unborn, the life of a, of a young child, the life of an older child, the life of an adolescent, the life of an adult. I should value life. I should value it because God value, values it. We see that every life is meant to reflect the living God and it's right to put value on them Regardless, now you may have heard this at some kind of hiring practice. We are to value life regardless of income level, gender, age, race, education. We are not to say, well, you're valuable, but you're not. You're valuable, but you're not. You're valuable, but you're not because, and then we put a qualifier on there, because we get to say you're valuable, not because we live in the Western world that says, oh, life is good, life is good, life is valuable. We get to value life because God says you're worthwhile. Here's what the Bible teaches so clearly. The Bible teaches that the Savior, Jesus Christ, declared your worth before time began, but he distinctly declared it at the cross. Amen. Oh, I'm going to give you another chance on that. He distinctly declared your value and your worth at the cross. Amen. Listen, that means I agree with that. That means that when Jesus said, I am going to give my life in your place, that means you are worth living for and you are worth dying for and you have worth because the Savior says you have worth. Not because of what you can do for him, not because of where you live, not because of the money you have, not because of any external that the world says is valuable. Jesus says you're valuable. So Christian, you need to look around and see that every human life has value and worth because the living God says, and he says it with his own blood, that you have worth. Now watch this. Watch what happens. Mordecai is going to, he's not seeking to be a hero, but he knows what's right to do and he does it. He overhears these two villains, Bigthan and Tereth, those are great names, once very trusted servants of the king who are plotting to assassinate the king. One commentary I read 
said that it might be because that they were loyal to the deposed Queen Vashti and they're still mad at him and they want him to pay for deposing her and, and sending her away. We don't really know what it was, but they are angry enough that they want to kill, kill the king. Though they know very well that probably will mean the end of their lives as well. They don't appreciate life. They don't appreciate the king's life. They don't appreciate their own life. Mordecai does this. He hears this. He shares the info with Esther. Esther then makes sure that the info gets to the king in the name of Mordecai. This is where it came from. There's an investigation. I love that. That's very, that's very Western in an Eastern description here. In Persia, there's an investigation. They find out this to be true. And these two men are held to punishment, capital punishment there in Persia. Now, let me just tell you, say, well, how, did, how in the world did Mordecai even hear this? I don't know. Maybe he was in the stall down from them in the bathroom. Maybe he overheard it in that way, but it's more likely that they were speaking in one of the many languages and thinking that nobody could understand what they were saying, that they spoke more than one language, and that he understood it and said, no, I've got I've to do something with that. I can't sit on that truth. I thought about this because my cousin, I remember my cousin who did not grow up, most of his life did not grow up in the United States, grew up in a different country, and he speaks a couple of different languages, and he was employed and he was telling me this in a big hotel chain at this point. And in this hotel chain, he was able to overhear some other employees speaking in their native language, their, their natural tongue, which he also spoke, but they didn't know it. And they were talking about how they were ripping off. They had a whole theft ring. How they were ripping off the hotel chain. They were ripping off all of its uh, people who were staying there. They knew how to steal and not get caught. And they had the whole system worked out. And they had so many people that were a part of this with them. And they were just kind of plotting and planning of what they were going to do next. And this was a great deal. And he's just, uh-huh, mm-hmm, uh-huh, listening in the background. And he turned it in. And this whole group of people were arrested. These whole group, this whole group of people were held to account. It is because he was in the right place at the right time. And we don't say this. Christians don't say, what a coincidence. Let's just go ahead. And would you just do this external, uh, external uh, sign, universal sign for what we believe about coincidence? What a coincidence. Wow, where is your faith? Do you not understand that the living God is over it all? This, this uh, uh, young man was in the right spot. Mordecai was in the right spot. He turns them in. Now, this is something that my life group, we were talking about this past Monday. It says that they were hanged. They were hanged uh, on a gallows. And uh, then I saw in a very like microscopic print at the bottom of my Bible here, it says this, or suspended on a stake. Do you realize that those are two different things? Hanged on a gallow or suspended on a stake? Well, here's the thing. They, this is what we agree upon. They were hung, suspended on something. They were suspended on something in this way. But what we discover is that in the Persian Empire, they uh, loved to show public executions as a deterrent to other people doing the same thing. And what they would do is they would take and they would sharpen a, a large post and they would hang you on it. Not hung, here's the difference, not hung from your neck. Not hung from your neck. You're saying, why are we learning this? Why are we learning this? It will come to play later in this book. In fact, I was driving past some hop fields. And I was thinking about all those stakes. I was thinking about you know, all the hops are down. They're all, you know, been roasted and toasted. And they're off to all the beer makers around the world. And now they're just all those poles. And I thought, man, the Persians would love this place. The Persians would love this place. Sharpen a couple of those stakes and they could just have a judicial system that's rolling. Now, not, not joking, we, here's what we understand, is that the Persian Empire, is been, they've been given credit for the beginning of the practice of crucifixion. Grisly, nasty, inhumane. We know this, that the Romans then took that and perfected it. And they, they did it so well that this is one of their signatures of the Roman Empire is crucifixion, that, that when our Lord Jesus was held accountable for our sins. He was crucified on a tree, not hung by the neck. 
but he was suspended. You say, man, I, I, this, is, this is terrible stuff. This is real world. Real world where heroes and villains both live. Understand this. Mordecai valued life. Whether or not he received any applause or praise or reward for it. Wouldn't you think that he would at least get a spa day? Wouldn't you think he would at least get some time off? What did he get? He got written down in the journal like, Mordecai is responsible for saving the king's life. And his reward was to show up at work the next day, just like any other day. No new robes, no new haircut, no new car, nothing. And some of you are like, Jason, you know, there's no new cars in that day. Okay, we got it, all right? And we're just saying he did not get rewarded. But this is the truth. If, if you or I or Mordecai, for that matter, only values life if it benefits us, then we are good candidates for the Nazi party. Think about this. If you only value someone's life, if it benefits you, if you only value somebody because if it can bring you something that you like or you want, then you fall right in line with the Nazi party who says, you're valuable and you're not. I find worth in you and I don't find worth in you. Listen, Christians, we don't pick and choose who has value and worth. We understand what the Bible teaches clearly that every person Jesus has declared in his own blood that you are worth dying for. And we don't argue with Jesus. We agree with him and we serve him and we serve others. Mordecai did this not to get praise. He did it because it was right to do. It was right to stand against evil. It was right to do that. Now he's going to have to stand against evil again. Because there aren't just a few villains in this world. There's a world of villains. Look at Esther chapter 3 verses 1 through 6. It says this. After these things, some time has passed. And you're going to see that time will pass in chunks. In just a few uh, verses here, we'll see that it will be the 12th year of the king's reign. Where we know that when he married Esther, uh, it was the 7th year of the king's reign. So time is passing in these these passages here, uh, more than you can uh, understand at first reading. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the Agagite. And that's a mouthful, but would you circle that in your Bible? Would you understand that that is an important piece of history? It will come uh, very much into play in what happens next. The Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and he advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to, the, to Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? This is, these are his peers. They're saying, Why don't you do what the king said to do? Why don't you do what he says? And when they spoke to him day after day, he would not listen to them. They told Haman, think about this. This is is a move to get yourself promoted. You go to the guy who's in charge right next to the king and say, hey, I've got some news for you of somebody who's not listening to you. He's in the the government and he's not working uh, with the rest of us. Let me tell you about him. Maybe I'll get something out of that. A spa day at least. They told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. Let's see how tough Mordecai is when the boss finds out. For he had told them that he was a Jew. Now, this is an interesting. I don't have anywhere to go with it, but I want you to realize this. He had told some of his co-workers over time that he was Jewish. Though he distinctly told Esther, don't you reveal this. Keep this to yourself. You say, well, what does that mean, Jason? I don't know. Um, And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. He said, that's not enough just to take care of one Jew. One of his people. It's not enough. You're hearing Satan getting a hold of Haman's heart in a real way. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy 
all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. He's saying, I'm going to deal with that man, but I'm going to deal with him. And I'm going to deal with every last distant relative he has. Everyone, I will have them dealt with. I will have them murdered. I will have them killed. So let's just stop right now and go back just a little bit. Where is this fury coming from? One, you see the king, in a lack of discernment, has provoked promoted a villain to a place of authority. It's a terrible day for the kingdom. Haman, the Agagite, that is important because if you know history, and it, this is a historical book, it is telling you this for a reason. You see, if you mark, maybe in your Bible, you might write next to chapter 3, verse 1, you might just write next to that in the margin right there, Exodus chapter 17. In Exodus chapter 17, you see the people of Israel who God has delivered in a mighty way from the land of Egypt, and they are making their way up to the promised land, the land of Canaan, the land we now call the nation of Israel. They're making their way there when in Exodus 17, they are in an unprovoked fashion, they are attacked from behind by the Amalekites who trace their lineage all the way back to Esau, the the brother of Jacob. There was this struggle the whole time and uh, we see that uh, where we say, man, this is a long-term hatred that we're going to uncover here. The Amalekites attack the Israelites. And we see that Joshua, the, the brave and courageous leader of the army of the Israelites, they fight back and they are fighting against the Amalekites. These are real people. They're real historically proven. You can know that and know their history. And during this battle, Moses, the leader of Israel, goes up with his staff, the staff of God, up onto a hillside where he can see the entire battle below him. And he raises his hands. And as long as his hands are raised, the Jewish people, the Israelite people, they prevail against the Amalekites. But when he gets tired, his hands start to go down. And then there is a surge from the Amalekites. This is just part of their history. This is why this is important. And so we see that Aaron's, Aaron, who is Moses' brother, and another man, his name is Hur. Terrible name for junior high, okay? Tough one. You know, what's his name? Hur. Oh, man. Sorry. And they come up and they hold up Moses' hands. And because Moses keeps his hands extended in the air, because these two men come alongside them, do you have any friends like that? Do you have any friends like Aaron and Hur who would come alongside you and help you? You need them. You need them in your life. They keep his hands extended. God gives the victory to the uh, Israelite army and the Amalekites flee. But at the end of Exodus 17, God makes a promise and really in almost in the form of a curse. And he says this, that I am going to deal with the nation, the people of Amalek, because they did this. You know what they wanted to do? They wanted to annihilate the Jewish people and take their stuff. That was the, the whole idea there. We're going to annihilate these people and we're going to take their stuff. See if that doesn't come out later in this passage. God said, I'm going to deal with them. Fast forward with me in history. The first Samuel, first Samuel chapter 15, where we see the first king of Israel. His name was King Saul and God gives him a task. He said, it's time to deal with the people of Amalek. Where it's time to deal with them. They are an evil people. They have been an evil people for hundreds and hundreds of years. They have been a continual source of idolatry and wickedness. They have tried to hurt the people of Israel again and again. I want you to go deal with them. I want you to wipe that out, wipe out that evil, and I want you to not allow anyone to take any of their stuff so that we cannot be, it cannot be said of us that we're just like them. God says, Saul, go do it. Saul kind of does it. Let me just give you this phrase. Hold on to this phrase. Partial obedience is disobedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. And God will hold King Saul accountable. In fact, he said, you're going to lose the crown because of this. You're not going to be king any longer. I'm going to choose somebody else. Because here's what King Saul did. He spared the best of the stuff. 
the, the best of the goats, the best of the sheep, the best of the stuff for himself and for his people, his soldiers. And he, he said, well, I, I thought it was a good opportunity. Oh, I also kept the king of Amalek alive. His name was Agag. Haman and Agagites. Apparently he kept more than just Agag alive. There were others who are kept alive. And when the king of Babylon years later came and swept through the region and took whoever he wanted into exile, he, only, he didn't only take from Israel, he also took from Amalek. And so Haman, his great-grandfather, or his grandfather, was taken and he has a deep hatred. And when he hears that Mordecai is a Jew, he knows his history. He knows his history. And he hates them. He hates them with a fury that Satan himself is fueling in the background. There's quite a lot of history happening here, but you need to see this. Number two, would you note this? The first thing we said was heroes value life. This is what a villain values. Villains are self-serving and devalue life. Villains are self-serving. They're about them. They're about their agenda. They're about what they want. And they're okay with devaluing life. Now let's just do a little survey here. Are you more like a hero or a villain? You today. Me today. Are you holding on to a grudge over a law? Are you holding on to something, a hurt or a longstanding grudge? Are you just letting that bake inside of you like Haman did when he heard that Mordecai was a Jew? Oh man, that had been burning in his heart that whole time. From his youngest days, that hatred had grown. Do you refuse to forgive? Do you have a form of racism for some group of people? Oh, I'm not racist. I just hate these people. I hate these people and and you have a reason why you hate them and why it's okay for you to hate them. You don't hate all people. You just hate these people. Do you ever wish to see an opponent, somebody who maybe has injured you, do you wish to see them hurt and or killed? Is that in your heart? Is that bubbling there? But you'd love to see them hurt and or killed. Are you plotting in some way that if, if, it, if it just served the timing was perfect, how you might harm them or bring harm to them or someone they love? If you answered yes to any of those things, it exposes that in the heart of every man, woman, boy, and girl is the heart of villainy. That's what we have naturally. We have to admit what is in our hearts naturally. Haman, we can be hard on him and not examine our own hearts. You see, this is what God said he would do. He would take a heart of stone, a hardened heart, a heart that is beating only for our own selfish purposes, and he would take that out, a heart transplant. And when you get forgiveness through Jesus, when you get new life through Jesus, when he comes and invades your life with his forgiveness, he says he'll take your heart of stone and he'll replace it with a heart of flesh, a heart that beats for the living God. That's what every Christian needs. That's the only way to have a hero status in the eyes of heaven is if you have a heart that beats for what God loves and values. By the way, he loves and values people. Or do you have a heart of villainy, self-serving, devaluing life, and you have all kinds of reasons why? Now here's a key to understand what's happening here. The king has elevated Haman to a position of authority. He's commanded everyone to, pay, uh, to bow down and pay homage. It's not just a, we recognize your office. We recognize that you're an authority. It's not just that. It is really, as I understand it, it is to say, bow down and give him worship. Ascribe to him the place of a little God in your life. Give that to Haman. And Haman loves it. You know what Satan wants more than anything else from you? He wants your worship. Haman loves it wherever he goes. He loves to see them bow down and give him worship worship 
And Mordecai says, I won't do it. Mordecai refuses to do it. He's not doing it in a blatant way. He's not standing there and flipping him off. Didn't picture that with Mordecai, did you? But he just won't do what he knows is not right to do. Not as a Jewish person, not as a follower of the one true God. Say, well, where do you get that from? If you knew your history, the Babylonian history, the king Nebuchadnezzar, he had done this very stunt before. He set up a huge golden statue and he commanded everybody when they heard, uh, they heard the music play to bow down and worship what he said to worship. Bow down and worship the statue. If you know that, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, written in the book of Daniel, they refused to bow down and worship. And so he said, I will have you killed. I love what they said to him. Our God is able to save, but even if he doesn't save us, we won't do that. I can't do that. We will not do that. That would be villainy. Now I'm just thinking about this. I'm thinking about how Mordecai was able to do this. It really is a consistency. How is he able to stand up against evil and these two men who wanted to kill the king and then he won't bow down over here? He's consistent that he will take a stand against evil. Not just some evil, just evil. Uh, he won't do it. He's consistent. He's already proved himself a good and faithful citizen, even though the, the king took really his daughter, his cousin, but who he raised as a daughter. He took her. And Mordecai was willing to save his life because it was right to do to honor God. I want to ask you this question. You have to answer this, especially as we approach the elections and people get stirred up on every side of the aisle. How can I be a good citizen and a good Christian at the same time? You've got to answer that question. How can I be a good citizen and a good Christian at the same time? I want to give you a multi-part answer. Here it is, very quickly. Be a good Christian first. Don't hear that as... Uh, against America. Don't hear that as against the USA. Don't hear that. I love the red, white, and blue. I love our nation. But the Bible very clearly tells me, and it tells you too, that if I'm going to be a good citizen and a good Christian, I must be a good Christian first. I must be a good Christian first. I must follow the king of kings. I must honor the king of kings and then honor the king. No, no, they're not always in opposition, folks. They're not always against one another. I can honor the king of kings and I can honor the king most times, but there'll be some times when I have to choose and I have to say, I can only honor the king of kings in this situation. Mordecai is choosing that. And you'll have to choose that. We are all to live as people under authority. If you cannot live under authority, it's going to be a difficult life for you. If you cannot live under authority, you can't listen to a boss. If you can't live under authority, police are always your problem. If you can't live under authority, you are against every form of government. Even though God said, I instituted government. I put governments in place. I put them in place even governments that are ungodly and wicked, which is all of them. Because they're filled with people who have villainy in their hearts, who are self-serving. Now watch this. What do we uncover about what is in Haman's heart? We see that there is a pride about him. And there is racism deeply rooted in his heart, and it is ugly. He submits himself to the rage and the wicked plans of Satan. And I would tell you, Christian, guard your heart. Even if God has given you a soft heart, a heart that beats for him, guard that heart because naturally in our flesh, we seek out what is self-serving. How do I be a hero then? How do, I, how do I not give in to the villainy that's in my own heart? How do I do that? I need to listen to what God says and let the Holy Spirit fill me to overflowing so that when I'm called upon to serve him, not with a cape, not with a mask, but wherever he's placed me, 
that I might serve him in a supernatural way. That he would give me the ability to say, I serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and I do that first. Let's finish this together. In fact, it won't be finishing it. It'll only be setting it up, really. Look at verse 7 and how, how it gets worse. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, the 12th, in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus, see that uh, time has passed. He married Esther in his seventh year. Five years have passed since then. King Ahasuerus, in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pure, that is like a dice. That is, they cast lots before Haman day after day. They're seeking out the counsel of the stars. They're seeking out the counsel of the false gods. It's really demonic and saying, we want to kill these people. When's the right time? Day after day, they did this and they cast month after month until the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to the king of Ahasuerus, watch how he does this. He withholds information. He only gives a little bit. There is a certain people, there's a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples of all the provinces in your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people. And they do not keep the king's laws so that it is not to the king's profits to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver. One record was this is $25 million he's willing to give. Maybe more than that. A talent is 75 pounds. 10,000. He's willing to pay for it to have them killed. This, this is what we call a bribe. Would you agree? I'll, I'll pay you to do what I want and circumvent the law. Change the law to your advantage. 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business that they may put it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman the Agagite. There it is again. The son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. He hates them. He's hated them since he was young. He's hated them because of his history. He's hated them. He's hated them because Satan hates them. And the king said to Haman, the money is given to you. Keep your money. The people also do whatever you want to do with them as it seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were summoned in the 13th day of the first month and an edict according to all the Haman commanded was written in the king's, by the king's satraps and the governors over all the provinces and the officials and all the peoples to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. And it was written in the name of the king Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by the couriers to the king's, all the king's provinces with instruction, now listen to the instruction, to destroy to kill and annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day. The 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. How do you get people to do what's wrong? Bribe them. Tell them, if you kill your neighbor, you can have their house. If you kill your neighbor, you can have their car. If you kill your neighbor, you can have whatever you want. Do it. This is wickedness. Which is the month of Adar, and so plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the people, uh, all the peoples to be ready for that day. Get ready. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. Now watch what happens. What, do the, what does the king do? And the king and Haman sat down to drink, to toast, to get drunk. But the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. Wow, there's a lot happening here. Let's try to just go through this very quickly. Eleven months to prepare. The first month, the killing order is to happen in the twelfth month. Get ready. Everybody get ready. To kill your friends, to kill your neighbors, to kill these people, and to take their stuff. Get ready. How can God allow this? I want you to see this, and this is an important point number three. Would you get this? God is the hero of every story. You might not see it just yet, but it's coming. 
This includes your story and my story. He is the hero of every story. If you're looking for a hero to believe in, I can point you to the hero of heaven. How do you know this? How do I know this? Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33. Just a, a verse that jumped out to me this week. Here's what it says in Proverbs 16, 33. The lot, the dice, the pure is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. He's not saying that he makes the dice roll over like some kind of Jedi mind trick. He's saying that there's nothing that escapes his eye. There's nothing that escapes his attention. There's nothing outside of his hand. There's nothing that you're going through that he doesn't know about. There's nothing that's so big in your life that he is not bigger than. I love that. You can't throw the dice and say, chance, coincidence, can you believe it? I see sovereignty and God's plan revealed when he wants to reveal it. There's nothing outside of his control. Now, I'm going to tell you, in this, we see some real-world problems. We see scheming advisors plus, plus a foolish king, a foolish leader, and those two together issue disastrous results for so many people. I pray for our government. I pray for those in power. Because if we have scheming advisors and foolish leaders, there will be disastrous results and you need to be praying for our government. How do we know this? We see it happen here. Purposely limited information given to the king, bribes, corruption, an edict that says this, destroy, kill, annihilate, plunder. And then the drinking to the destruction of others. There is real villainy in this story. And we are begging for the hero to rise. We're begging for a hero to show up and value life. The city of Susa was thrown into confusion. They'd never seen something like this done in this terrible way before. You can see it happening. The, the, the place is in an uproar. The whole time, the king and Haman are drinking, getting drunk cheering each other on. But many, many simply did, did nothing. All it takes for evil to prevail, maybe you've heard this before, all it takes is for evil to prevail is for a good man or good men to do nothing. God will not stand by and do nothing. See, there are plenty of heroes in this world. There are plenty more villains. And here is what God is going to call upon Mordecai and Esther and you and I. And he's going to say, stop bowing down like the rest of culture. Stop bowing down like the rest of culture and do what is right. Do what is right in your home. Do what is right in your neighborhood. Do is what is right at your workplace. Do it what is right at your school. Do what is right in your friend group. Do what is right. And be a difference maker. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. And we're going to celebrate the difference maker that is Jesus. The hero of every story is Jesus. You just have not seen him and what he's going to do yet. We leave here with a big kind of cliffhanger of saying, this is terrible news. The villains are winning. But the hero is not done. Let's pray and ask God's help that you would be a difference maker this week, that I would be a difference maker this week. Would you join me as we pray? Father in heaven, you're the difference maker. You're greater than all. You're greater than all the villains. You're greater than all the hurts. You're greater than all the anger. You're greater than all the rage. You're greater than all the sin that this world can throw at us. And I pray that we would listen to you and we would follow you. I pray for every person in their sphere of influence this week that they would be a difference maker because your Holy Spirit gives them opportunity to stand up and say, I'm going to follow the King of Kings and I'm going to follow the Lord of Lords. I'm going to be what God asked me to be, a difference maker in my world. All praise to the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen.